Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. Nice to have you here. Before we jump into it, don't forget, go to YouTube and click that subscribe button and the little bell is going to make sure that you get the notifications anytime we're live or when we post new videos. When we clean out our computer or other electronics, we tend to turn to what? Jeff, any guesses? A uh, can of compressed air. Compressed air. Yeah. Yep. A can of compressed air right? Uh, we've all been there. Um, anybody who's worked on computers, this is kind of what we're used to using. Yeah, and it's the go-to. Yeah, mm -hmm. the fact is, is that you don't even think twice. This is kind of what you go and grab. But here's the thing. What do you see? Danger. Danger. <laughs> Keep out of reach of children. Extremely flammable. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of warning signs Explosive all over this warning. thing. And, and sometimes when you're working on cleaning your computer out or something like that, it can actually squirt like a moisture. Yeah, it's a weird watery thing. Yeah. 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 Which to me, like, I don't particularly want that getting into my computer. Oh, and as it turns out, this is not actually full of compressed air at all. What? Oh. It's like flammable gases and a mix of all kinds of serious? chemicals and everything else. Yeah. Oh, I'm completely serious here, Jeff. No um, so John Shearer set out to provide an alternative. Okay. And John is joining us here to talk about his canless air product. John, thank you so much for being here on the show with us this week. You're welcome. I appreciate you having me. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself right out the gate? Just, uh, I'd love to know a little bit about your backstory and where you come from and how you found yourself developing a product as an alternative to this canned compressed air. Well, well, I, I taught computers for, uh, with video professor for 20 years. And I did that and got out of that. Um, and a guy came to me with an idea. Long story short, it's canless air is the idea. Mm. I took the product and redesigned it, re-engineered it, um, and it is what it is today. It's what I believe you have in your hand probably. I, I'm going to grab it here for, for us, John. Um, so here it is. This is the canless air system. I've got the X3 Hurricane. Thank you very much, John, for sending that to us. You have this one. Yes, that's right. And so what I want to show you is that the footprint between a can of canned compressed air and the canless air is roughly the same. So on a shelf, this is virtually the same. But when I think about like what I want to what I want to use if I'm environmentally conscious is something like a compressor. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Which takes up a massive amount of space compared to something like this or this. Um, why does it really matter? And, and maybe before I even ask that question, John, I think I mentioned at the top of, of our discussion here as a computer geek myself, as a computer user um, and a technician, I'm always using this kind of thing, the, the compressed, right. the traditional compressed air. And I never think twice about it. OK, so consider that like. That's readily available. I can pick that up at any ready shop and any computer shop is selling that. And as a computer guy, I've never thought twice about it. Right. And then along comes canless air system and starts to make me think, well, maybe I should be thinking about the environmental impact. Can you tell us a little bit about what is dangerous about these like compressed air dusters and, and, and how the products differ? Well, what you have is a, 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 a bomb actually in your hand. And I mean, literally, yeah. um, when there, that can, if that was exposed in, uh, we're in Arizona, if that was left in your car in the summer for an hour or two, it would explode. Um, it's, it's very dangerous. The, the thing that you, in getting our product, you must have realized, you must see that, that, our product can do everything canned air can do, and it runs for a long time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't freeze up because that can of canned air has dangerous chemicals in it. And if 
Did you use canned air on your camera lenses? Yeah, I've used it on camera lenses, on computer keyboards, on servers, on the inside, on hey, the outside, everything. Yeah. I hope that you won't use canned air anymore because one of the worst things uh, to use canned air on camera lenses, you can ruin the lens. Really? Because you know how canned air sometimes spits out liquid? Yeah, that's a concern for me um, on the inside of a computer or something. I think about Yes, if like, it gets, well, if it, for sure, if it gets on a camera lens, it'll ruin it. Wow. Huh. It'll ruin a camera lens. What, we have a lot of camera shops, a lot of camera people buying our product because it's safe. Yeah. It's just blowing air. It's just, it, you know, air coming out of here and you can turn it upside down or sideways. It doesn't matter. That you can't. If you, you have can't, you ever yeah. turned the canned air um, upside down? Uh huh. That's when the liquid comes out. The liquid comes out. You're yeah. correct. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so, and and it freezes up. You know that you that can after a while gets very cold. Yeah. What causes that, John? That's the chemicals in there. And turning it upside down. If you sprayed it on, you can get frostbite from. If you turned it upside down and sprayed it on your skin for a little bit, you can get frostbite. So there's many reasons that I developed this product. I mean, there's the green aspect. There's a safety aspect for sure. And people didn't have a choice. They, they had no choice. And so that's why this got developed. And, and I made it. I heard you mention about the size, the same size of a yeah. can of canned air. That's what we did. We had the engineers hold canned air in their hand and then design this. And it's designed for a woman's hand too. It, it can A woman can hold this very comfortably and use it. How's that feel, Sasha? It feels good. Does that feel all right? Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> we, had, well, we had women that uh, actually test it and, yeah. and pull the trigger on it. It's easy to use. Yeah. And this last, as you know, it lasts about a good solid 15 to 20 minutes. If you pull the trigger and let it run, yeah. it'll run that long. That's awesome. You can recharge it 500 times. Wow. wow. So uh, one charge of this is equal to, I don't know, five or six cans of canned air. Just one charge. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that cow, sounds about dude. right. That's incredible. This unit, this unit is equivalent to a minimum of a thousand cans of canned air. Okay, well, that is at least a week of compressed air for me, John. <laughs> <laughs> at least that. That's a big amount of money. Yeah. I don't know what you pay true, for true canned enough. air, but probably somewhere between five and ten dollars. Uh, yeah, they're like eight bucks. A can like this okay, is like eight so bucks. Take that times a thousand. That's eight thousand dollars. So uh, it's. It, it gets very big for the homeowner. It's, you know, a homeowner may use a can every month or every yeah. few months or whatever it is. Yeah. But a business burns through them. They burn through them. Sure. What we had happened, we've had, corporate America is, is the ones that discovered us and they use this. We had a company that has bought this product from us since we started. They bought uh, about 8,000 of these units so far. They use them to clean cash registers, ATM machines, parking meters, uh, uh, computers. They use it for everything. Oh, uh, fire alarm people, professionals, oh. uh, industrial fire alarms. Yeah, that makes sense. They use these. Okay. John, can I ask? So these these guys here. So if this is if, if this is really going to do say a thousand cans of compressed air for me. What is the, again, I've never really thought about this. Okay. What's the environmental impact of the traditional like blow off compressed air? What kind of impact are we having on landfills, um, the chemicals, all of those kinds of things? You must know the stats being in the industry. Uh, the environmental impact. I used to have all the numbers. I used to know all the, 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 the major impact that it has. But I can let, let me tell you this. First of all, corporations that buy canned air have to dispose of them. that can you have when it's done. Yeah, they have to take it and drill a hole in the can, 
and you don't just throw it in the trash. I know you guys probably do every, you know, a homeowner or something just throws it in the trash. Yeah. You know what, John? I, I throw it in the recycle with high do hopes. You? With high mm-hmm. hopes that it will be recycled. Yes. But I don't really know. Like, is it recyclable? I don't really know the answer to that. Right. It probably is. It probably is. But the environmental impact, it's like, um, oh, I forget how many can. There's 30 million cans of this stuff, as near as we can tell, uh, thrown away uh, every year. Wow, man. Um, that's a big number. And yeah. and they, um, I don't know what they end up doing with it. I really don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, other than, you know, they drill out the... They drill a hole so it can't explode then once it's being recycled. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's corporate America gets points. They get green points for sustainability. Yeah. In buying, if when they use our product, they get points because their uh, canned air is on the the list, the list of bad oh, things. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. That's very good. So when I think about, so if this is going to replace, say, a thousand cans of compressed air, how long is it actually going to last? Like what, how long is the product good for? Oh, well, you can recharge it 500 times. So if it lasts 20 minutes times 500, and we have people that bought these back in 2012 and they're still using them. Oh, fantastic. Wow. <laughs> You use them forever. Yeah. I looked at one today in the office that was all taken apart. It had been sent back. Something happened with the, with the bottom of the motor. It was a weird thing we've never seen before. We sent the person a new one, but they've been using it for, I don't know, seven years. Wow. Um, so they, they're they just really, really durable. Good. Good, man. Um, and what are some interesting uses um I, I mean, you can think of the uh, the practical use. I, I can tell you what I just used compressed air for this weekend, oh, yeah? which is not the best thing in the world to do, it turns out. My so husband, you were using like the yes, traditional thing. And my husband's going to okay. be so happy he was right. Yes. So I was dusting off. He has these little model motorcycles and they have little spokes in the wheels. And I said, "Hun, can you get me some compressed air? And he handed it to me. He's like, be careful with this. It's really dangerous. And I was like, Pfft whatever <laughs> i started spraying away thinking there was no problems now he's probably watching now doing like the touchdown dance yeah yeah <laughs> ha, i was right and he- you, you know of the dangers of this product that you've got right you know that people you know people huff that stuff i've heard they, of that john why why would you why? do that Oh, they get high. They get really high. Really? It's a high. It's more addictive than heroin. You got to be kidding. Oh, yeah. To to shoot that in your mouth is more addictive than heroin. The problem Don't is, this, folks. Yeah, do, do not do this. But to shoot it in your mouth with the thing up like that, yeah. straight up, um, it, uh, it gets in your lungs. Yeah. And everybody is different. I might squirt some in my mouth and I'm fine. You squirt it in your mouth for the same amount of time I did and you're dead. You die because you can't breathe. Yeah. It suffocates you. Wow. So suffocate. like that's that. Okay. That's a whole other can of worms that we're jumping into. Oh now. no, that's a whole nother deal. Yeah. That's- it's a dangerous thing so- to have in the home is what I guess I'm saying. And that's exactly what comes to mind as a parent. Yes. If somebody's, listening to us now and they have canned air in their home and they have children, get it out of there. And I mean that sincerely. Hide it, do whatever. If you insist on having it there, get it out of away from where the kids can get to it. Wow. So the question then, John, and I'll word it like this. Can I get high off of your product? <laughs> <laughs> we have- we, you know, we had somebody write a review and they said, I, the problem is we can't get high off of this. <laughs> it's not the same thing. It's That's not funny. the same thing. I read that the other day. We can't, problem with this is we can't get high off of it. And it so, 
No, you can't. See, it's just it's taking in air in these vents, right? And these vents here and blowing it out this here. So it's the same it's air that's the already air. there. If your room is full of hot air, which I assume your room is there, guys, <laughs> a lot of hot air, and you pull the trigger, thanks, John, and it it'll blow out hot air. I'll kid aside, it, it, it's just whatever's in the room. All right, let's give it the ultimate test. The X3 Hurricane canless air system with the variable speed control on my anemometer. And I'm going to start at the very lowest speed and gradually work my way up from there. So hitting about 9, 10, oh, 12, 20, almost 30 kilometers an hour. Oh, and you see that? It kind of dropped way down and then started up again, it, almost like it switched into second gear. Okay, increasing, let's hit 50 kilometers an hour, almost there. Oh, and you see, there it goes again. So now we're in like a third gear, so there's some kind of gearing mechanism in there. And my anemometer can only go up to 90 kilometers an hour. Um, we're probably gonna hit that, oh, there we go, 96. I guess, well, 100. So I guess the anemometer is reading higher than its limit, but uh, it's probably inaccurate at this point. Hitting 101.5 kilometers per hour and capping off. So I think that's uh, all my anemometer is capable of. But obviously we're getting over 100 kilometers an hour wind off of the X3 Hurricane. Now, John, one of the questions we have from our chat room is they're wondering... Uh, after you've expended the uh, 500 charges, is there a way to extend the life of the product by a replacement battery? No. How long do they want this to last? <laughs> <laughs> I think the rest of their life. Indefinitely, John. 500 times? Just to give you an idea, around the house. People that have these, I have these around my house. Yeah. Around the house, if you charge it once a month, that's probably a lot. Right. So let's say you charge it once a month. So 12 times a year, and it's good for 500 times. That's you can do that math. Time. How old are they going to be? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's quite old. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. So no, we this thing is sealed. The battery's in there. It's not, a, it's not take the batteries out, put other batteries in. Right. These are high-end batteries that we use in here. We were talking about it the other day in the office, and we said it took us a while to perfect this and get the right combination between the battery, the charger, and the motor. Mm -hmm. The battery we have is just off the top. It's unbelievable. Fantastic. So, so whoever wrote that in, tell them. You are, and it's guaranteed for a lifetime. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So does that take care of that question? You yeah. Got now, as far as, as far as the guarantee for a lifetime, what kind of warranty comes with uh, your unit? A lifetime. Oh, it is li a lifetime warranty. Okay. Well, there you go. So, That's simple and yeah. easy. <laughs> so you buy this. That person does not have to worry about changing the batteries. Okay. If something goes wrong, send it to us. We'll send you a new one. Oh, that's fantastic. Excellent, John, where can we buy canless air? Because, you know, there's the, the cost savings. Well, yeah, canlessair.com. Okay. Is that? And, canlessair.com. And everything we've been discussing here yeah. is on the site. It compares canned air with our product. It shows all the different models we have. The one you guys have in your hand, this yep. X3 variable speed, is the absolute best unit we've got. Very nice. Because... You can pull the trigger just a little, and just a little air is coming out, or you can pull a lot, a lot of can air. Can I do this, John? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, Zach. Right. Here, let's. There. <laughs> but it's so canlessair.com is where you can buy it. People also buy it on Amazon. You got to be on Amazon, right? But but it, to go straight to us is the best way to do it. To go right to canlessair.com, buy the product. Okay. Very good. John, and I... the variable speed. Oh, yes, go ahead. Is it really variable? Yeah. Huh? Oh, my goodness. Uh, John, are you kidding me? You I didn't even realize. 
You didn't know that? It's like a it's like a drill. Oh, yeah. you're a sharp one. Look at that. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> so this is like Yeah, so you can have the, the can, light. Yeah. And then you can have the intense. No, our other ones. We have other ones. Love Here's it. one. Yeah. This this is only one speed, fast. Oh, okay. okay. Just fast. But I, for your for your viewers and for you guys. The thing you have in your hand there, this one, the variable yeah. speed, X is hurt. hands down the best thing we've come up with. And I, I love it because you don't always need all the power. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you can I just spray it a little bit. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. And I mean, even the attachments that it comes with, the different yeah. heads, like, just so you guys know, gives it a lot of functionality. They're like vacuum heads. No, no real big deal. But I mean, it's, it's, it's something, good. yeah, it just extends it, right? But I mean, that's nice because that's something you don't get with a can of compressed air. So you get I mean, a little tube. <laughs> you have the environmental impact, but you also have the longevity of life impact. And now you've got these extensions. I mean, it's like, it's everything you need. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So John, thank you so much for the product, for the time that you've spent with us You're today. You're welcome. I hope if anything, we've gotten across. I mean, yeah, yeah. Thank you. this this is a, a product that um, as a computer technician or somebody that's working in a computer shop like you just absolutely have to have it because you, you're going to have this anyways so this is this product is a great product it's used by by half the fortune 500 companies use this product yeah wow and that's pretty impressive very good man well congrats on a fantastic product and we're, we wish you every success with canless air well, thank you. Thank you. And I, again, I appreciate being on anytime you want a good laugh. Send us an email <laughs> and we'll hook up again. Very good. Sounds thank good. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a great night. You as well. Thank you. Get your X3 Hurricane Canless Air System at canlessair.com. I like that. We've got to take a quick break, folks. When we get back, we're going to be talking about, well, some Linux alternatives to Windows 10. Stick around. So with Windows 7 being EOL, aka end of life, we all have this situation if we use Windows on our network that, well, the operating system is now depreciated. It's no longer safe to use Windows 7. That's right. right? I was going to say, it hasn't been depreciated for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Windows 7 is, is now what we call end of life. And, yeah. and some folks have said, well, I don't need Microsoft support. I've never once in my entire Windows usage ever required Microsoft support. Right. Sorry, and I'm all tangled up here. There we go. Now I'm better. So if you, do, if you don't ever have to call Microsoft support, why does it matter to you if Microsoft no longer supports Windows 7? Right. Well, isn't it patches and such? Yeah. 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 So... yeah. so consider this. That's support. So when we think of support, we think about being able to pick up the phone yeah. and call technical support. Well, that's not at all what it's talking about. What it's talking about is that the support of basically f them fixing problems that they find is gone. Right. So what that means is whenever a hacker finds a way to compromise a Windows 7 machine, Microsoft used to fix it and roll it out as an update and, and probably break a couple things that, along the way, but yeah. inevitably fix the bug that was causing hackers to be able to get into your system. Well, now they're not going to do that. So as hackers find exploits in Windows 7, Microsoft is just going to say, well, it's no longer supported. Right. So we are not going to be patching that. And now if you're running Windows 7, you've got this very bad situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe you've got a mix of Windows 7, Linux, Windows 10, and, and that one Windows 7 machine, or God forbid, a Windows XP machine. Sadly, those still exist. They still exist. Yeah. Right? So if any of those exist that are no longer being patched or supported, it can be a really bad situation because that's one it's a door. It's a doorway, like a back door into your computer. No, your network. 
all of all of your devices. Yeah. Okay. So we have to move to Windows 10, but maybe our computer can't handle Windows 10. I mean, we've got to get more RAM. We've got to get an SSD in order to be able to run it at a reasonably decent speed. So that means a, a, a new hard drive. And by that point, it's like, do you really sink the money into this old thing? See, you're speaking to my current situation. I have yeah. an old Windows XP system that I, I'm setting up for our kids at home yeah. so that they can use it for schoolwork and stuff separate mm -hmm. than our Family computer. Okay. So yeah. if somebody's playing games, there's still the school or computer. Yeah. But I don't want to upgrade this old system that's 10 years old. Yeah. Do you, are you really going to put a couple hundred bucks into something when you can walk into a super center and for 600 bucks, walk away with a pretty decent computer? Exactly. You know, a low end, but fast. Still. We'll say. I'm looking for the free fix. Yeah. You've already mm -hmm. got the gear. So, you know, what are you going to do? So... Do we put more RAM into it? Do we put a new hard drive into it, an SSD? And do we do all that work? Or do you just, hey, you know, wipe it and put something else on there that's powered by Linux? That's the option. That's the one. Yeah. So that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I've done and that's what I continue to do. And that's so. what you will also do. Once you hear why. <laughs> so personally, so this is kind of like a, a personal opinion piece, but... Personally, what I have been leaning toward is Linux Mint okay. over the past little while. Because the question comes up, well, what distro, okay, this is a new word if you're a Windows user. Yeah. It's short for distribution. Mm -hmm. What distro of Linux or what flavor of Linux are you going to use? Mm -hmm. Because you a lot of the Linux names are based on foods. That, that is true. true. Yes. Linux Mint. What yes. flavor? Mint. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. What flavor? So the computer that I was talking about, I had tried a few different distros. I had um, Ubuntu Mate. Mm -hmm. uh, I had... Also a good option. Um, I had um, Lindos uh, from Linspire. Linspire. Yeah, yeah Linspire. No longer Lindos. Yeah, that, I know. If it was that Windows, was a throwback. that's like That was a throwback. XP. No, no, Linspire. Yeah. Uh, but I ended up uh, settling on a Linux Mint. Yeah. yeah. See, and I had, was it Zorin? Zorin OS. On here yeah. before I switched to Cloud Ready. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Linux Mint for me, it's a Debian-based mm -hmm. system. So this is the same core that Ubuntu is based on. Right. So I, I don't have to, and, and I'm a very big Debian fan. Uh, all my servers are like Debian uh, Buster, uh, stretch before that. And I'm always up to date with the latest in Debian systems and 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 so uh and i run stable i don't tend to run testing unless it's it's feature locked and ready to go into stable mm -hmm. um and what that means again if you're new to the linux world um debian is basically it, there's a hierarchy so you've got like debian you've got red hat you've got a couple other ones as well but those are kind of the big ones that i think you're going to encounter yep. we don't need to really clutter the landscape but so debian being one that it's going to be based on. It could be Ubuntu. It could be Linux Mint. It could be uh, any number. Uh, you mentioned Ubuntu Mate, another one, which is essentially Ubuntu with a different interface. Yes. Because Mate is like the menu, the, de right. the, the desktop environment. So um, now Linux Mint is also Mate, but it's, it's based on Ubuntu. Correct. All right. So... It, it's like this whole, it's like this tree of hierarchy of where did this Linux come from? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you've got Debian is like this fantastic server environment, but then Ubuntu Canonical is creating a desktop version of that. And it's fantastic. It's called Ubuntu. And that's where Ubuntu Mate comes from. And then you've got Linux Mint, which is a fork of that. Another word for you. It's a, like they've copied the, the code base and then they've tweaked it and made it the way that they want it. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that I've settled on and it's fantastic. So I get all the benefits of Debian. I get the benefits of Ubuntu and I get the benefits of the Linux Mint community as well. Right. And so I end up with this extremely polished desktop operating system that will run on my old hardware that I don't have to upgrade the RAM, that I don't have to buy a new SSD and it works fantastically. And, it, and it's fairly familiar. I don't mm -hmm. have to relearn the entire desktop paradigm in order to get used to it. It's right. pretty intuitive. Like I could, Very. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. now you talked about stable version versus yes. experimental. 
I think it was test. The, test. Test. Yeah. So for somebody who's Sid, we'll just say. getting into this and they're like, oh, I downloaded the experimental. What's the pitfall to experimental versus stable for them? Uh, testing uh, or SID is what Debian calls it. So way up at the higher level of the hierarchy, which you're probably not going to touch as a new Linux user. Okay. So remember that Debian is like up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So SID is a testing version of Debian. Uh, stable is, is what they consider stable. It's been tested. Yep. Okay. So it's already gone through the testing phase. If you were going up here, going to testing is going to end up giving you newer packages. So like when the new version of GIMP comes out, GNU image manipulation program, you're going to have the latest and greatest right. immediately part of the operating system, but it may not be stable. It may crash. It may have bugs and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff because it hasn't gone through that testing phase yet. Right. Once it hits stable, Ubuntu users would say it's older version. Right. Right. Debian users will say it's stable. Yes. It, it doesn't crash. It doesn't have any problems. Okay. So that's a big difference between Ubuntu and Debian. Debian stable means it's gone through a lengthy, maybe two year testing process. Like proofreaders that are using yeah. it and it's fixing it. It's ready to go. It, it is safe to use yeah. and it's stable. Okay. So it's rock solid. Ubuntu, a little more bleeding edge, a little more cutting edge, and, and the software versions are going to be a little bit newer, um, and the package managing and everything else is a little bit tweaked for mm -hmm. end users, mm -hmm. but you're not dealing anymore with testing versus stable. It's just, here's Ubuntu, yep. and that's what you get. So it's now it comes down to, is it LTS? Any guesses what that means? Or is it not LTS? Uh, oh. Lifetime service? Very close. Uh, Long-term support. Long-term support. Okay. Yes. So what that means, so when you see an Ubuntu release that is LTS, long-term support, which is currently, I, is it 12.04 is the current LTS? It's seven. No, no, it can't be 12. No. Come on, 2012. One. Uh, no, 18.04. Yes. Um, so, uh, man, I'm in the past. <laughs> Today you're in the past. That's because I talked about Lindos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so LTS means that version is going to continue being supported. Think of, along the terms of what I mentioned about Microsoft. It's right. going to continue getting those patches and fixes for a very long time, mm -hmm. years. Okay. So if you're new and you don't want to have to reinstall every couple of years or go through the upgrade process, go with LTS. If you like the brand new versions, go with the current version, which right now it's 2020. 20, uh, it's not quite April, but because it's almost April, that means that uh, 2004 is going to be coming out um, in April because it represents the date. Right. Okay. So it's every October and April. Um, it so, celebrates its birthday in April like I do. Is that what happens? Exactly. Yes. Exactly okay. like that. <laughs> so the most recent version then, therefore, would be 1910. 19.10. Um, so and those you just versions. blew somebody's mind by explaining that. Yeah, a little bit because somebody's like, "That's how they got the That's numbers." Yeah, there was ten four. iterations of it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's October 2019. Um, so that version would be the latest current version of Ubuntu, but it's not LTS. Right. Mm -hmm. So you you'd have to then go to 2004 when it's released through the upgrade path, which is pretty easy. Yeah. Now Linux Mint, I believe, subscribes to a very similar model. Um, but they base theirs on the LTS of Ubuntu. So you're going to get LTS, uh, I believe, anyway. Well, but they have the iterations throughout as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, like right now, it's Linux Mint 19, I believe, 19.2, something like that. So so it's just it's how it trickles down. So that's what I've settled on is Linux Mint because I find for my laptop, for my desktop, it's like the rock solid. It's got, it's got current software. I can install whatever I want on it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful and it works great. Yep. You mentioned Cloud Ready. Yes. Which basically has turned Sasha's laptop into. It's a Chromebook. A Chromebook. Yes. So you took your old laptop and turned it into a Chromebook. And how was, how was that for you? It's great. I mean, it, it works well. I, I have all of my access through the cloud, right? Yeah. So I, I mean, you're already I use, using Google Docs. I and use, stuff? Yeah, exactly. I use Google Docs and slides and, you know, all of that. And and so it was really intuitive for me. Like I had no problem switching to cloud ready. But that, from what it was Zorin that I from had. Zorin. And before that, before that, I was was I Windows? I must have been Windows at some point. Wait, yeah. Windows? I was Windows Seven. I was. She's a got sticker. the sticker. <laughs> <laughs> but I block things out. I don't like. I don't remember this. Fair enough. Yeah. And Jeff, 
You mentioned Lindos. Lindos. And Windows Let's, XP. Yes. So you're more old school than me. Uh, yeah. What are you running at home for real? Uh, so on my, we have the two systems. Well, we have three systems. There's okay. my wife's Mac because she okay. likes Mac. Yeah. Um, on our family computer, we have a dual boot system of Linux oh. Mint and Windows 10. Nice. And the reason for the dual boot is because of computer games. Yeah. I was going to guess gaming. Yeah. It's going to be gaming. gaming. That's why. Yep. Yep. Um, so, I mean, my kids are now at the age where they're like, you know, they're getting into some of those. Roblox. Oh, they're past that now. What else requires Windows? What requires Windows? It's, uh, it's all Roblox. So, um, some of our. Uh, Fortnite. Yep, some of our Steam games mm -hmm. uh, are Windows only. Um, what else do I have? Uh, oh, goodness. I'm trying to think of some of the games that are Windows only. You don't game on your laptop. I do not. This is strictly that. like the strictly business. Yeah. Strictly uh, the business. That's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm completely blanking on what all's on the computer that's so, not through Steam. Okay, so gaming on the Windows 10. Yeah. And you, uh, Jeff has mentioned something that we haven't talked about yet tonight. The dual boot? Dual booting. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that he's chosen. So your computer is obviously good enough to run Windows 10 anyways. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's a different scenario in some ways. However, if your computer is able to support it and you still want to go the route of Linux, yeah. you can do dual booting. Can you explain to us what that means? Yeah. So with dual boot, I have partitioned the hard drive. Uh, that's a fancy word, Jeff. Yeah, okay, so partition means I took the space of the hard drive yeah. and I segmented it off into different portions. And so... Is that hard to do? No, it's really Does easy it have to, to be a straight 50-50? It does not have to be a straight 50-50. And so my initial boot was not Windows. It was Linux. So, so I started, originally it was just Linux. Yeah, it, originally, because it, it was a computer I built. Okay. So it was a blank hard drive and my first install was Linux mm -hmm. because when I'm doing the install, it says, do you intend to do a dual boot? And so, really? yeah, so that was one of the install options. And I'm like, yes, I intend to do a dual boot. And so that's what happened is mm -hmm. I set up the dual boot. Uh, I'm blanking on what the dual boot program is called. Um, G Parted? No. No. Uh, it's uh, the installer process. Yeah. I'm, I'm blanking on what it's called. Anyway. Um, so that popped up in the install and it's like, okay, how much do you want to partition on your hard drive for oh, okay. your Linux operating yeah, system? Yeah. And so I set up. It was not quite a 50-50 split because I need a ton of space for the games that get installed. Right. Yeah, so okay. uh, it was more Windows. I think it's 25-75 split mm -hmm. all in all on the hard drive. Uh, that was the first time I did the install. I've since wiped the computer, reinstalled it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was when I had my spinning hard drive. Okay. And then after I installed Linux, I booted up again, installing Windows uh, on the second partition. Since wiping out that and going with my SSD... Uh, it's, uh, the SSD, I think is 500 gigs and I have two terabytes spinning hard drive Yeah. for, and so that's where my data is on the spinning hard drive. Yeah. And then I'm using the SSD for the operating system and that's a 50, 50 split. Okay. Very complicated sounding, but no, it's but, but not, but from the scenario of a user who say is using windows and wants to experience Linux and, and, and use Linux because it's safer. Because I know I can surf the internet. My kids can use the computer. I don't have to worry about viruses like I do with Windows. Those kinds of things. Um, so let's say your kids sit down at the computer and they want to switch between Windows and Linux or vice versa. How is that process? So all we have to do is we... Um if I'm in Windows, we go through a system restart, and then on the boot, mm -hmm. it brings up the dual boot screen. The default, if the computer just starts up by itself, yeah. is to go into Linux. Yes. I want it to go into Linux automatically. Mm -hmm. If, the, say, Windows does a system update in the middle of the night or something, right? and the computer boots, I want to know that I'm going into Linux, where it's a safe environment for the computer to sit, mm -hmm. as opposed to Windows, Okay. Uh, where it could be exposed to something. So sure. it's an automatic boot into Linux, but... At the dual boot screen, they can drop down the menu and select the Windows boot. Brilliant. And the I kids know how it. the kids know how to work it. It's totally easy and they know when they can switch between Linux and Windows. Yep. Not a problem. So it's, you want a game? Get into Windows. Yeah. If you want to do anything else, Linux is where it's at. That's right. And I mean Perfect. our our daughter just turned nine and she's been doing it now for two years. So if a seven year old can do it, yep. like it's not that hard. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah. Linux Mint, Ubuntu, all these technologies that we're talking about, Debian, they're available for free. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely free. 
Mm -hmm. and you can just download them off of their respective websites. Um, Cloud Ready, same thing. How much did that cost you? Zero dollars. Zero dollars. So you can't even say this is a a sales pitch because it's free. (laughs) Hey, you know, here you go. Take it. So that's 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 where it's at. So that's good. I think it's a good solution. So hey, let us know. Comment below how you're utilizing open source operating systems, technologies, and how it's able to, you know, in Jeff's environment, help keep his kids safe, help to keep his computer safe from Mm -hmm. infiltration. Sasha, it's breathed new life into an old laptop. It's given her the ability to access her cloud-based applications like Google docs and yeah. and you mentioned spreadsheets is exactly. all that kind of stuff and and you can do it from there you can jump onto any other computer and you've got access to it for me i just need a powerful linux desktop operating system on my laptop and that's where linux mint comes in for me how's it impacting you what is open source doing for you lately comment below we'd love to hear from you in the meantime we've got to jump over to the newsroom so sasha if you're ready Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.tv newsroom. Mycroft AI's Linux voice assistant has attracted a lawsuit, and the creators decided to fight the patent troll tooth and nail. A US a US-based natural gas facility shut down operations for two days after being hit by ransomware. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, has pledged $10 billion to fight climate change. And Ring Doorbell Maker makes two-factor verification mandatory. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson. Well, some quick honorable mentions this week. Dell Technologies is selling its InfoSec business RSA for $2.075 billion (laughs) as it tries to reduce its long-standing debt. RSA helps companies confirm user IDs and manage other security security risks. It serves 30,000 customers, ranging from banks to consumer goods makers. It also runs security conferences, including one scheduled for this month in San Francisco that IBM, incidentally, dropped out of recently. Mm. The sale which was rubber stamped on Tuesday, was made to a consortium led by STG Partners, a private equity investor that specializes in tech, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan Board, and Dutch private equity group. Uh, It's called Alfinvest Partners. Alfinvest Partners or Alpinvest? Something like that. We'll say Alpinevest. All right, that works. Yeah. Microsoft released a buggy security update for Windows 10 last week. Surprise. Now, some Windows users report that uh, all of the files on their desktop have been deleted. <clears throat> Don't worry. It hasn't actually been deleted. Uh, thankfully, those files are still there. The update just moved them to another user accounts folder. That's better than the last time when Microsoft actually deleted people's files back in the October 2018 update. While files appear to the user to be deleted and settings such as the start menu and desktop customization appear to be reset to default, what's actually happening is that Windows 10 is signing people into a temporary user profile to be used during the update process. But for some people, it's failing to restore the user's proper profile when the update is complete. Odd. The buggy update is KB45326900. Wow. I have the utmost respect for you, Sasha, having to read those very (laughs) tiny numbers. (laughs) Microsoft released uh, this update for Windows 10 on February 11th of 2020. Windows Update will automatically install it on your PC. If the system has already installed the update and you haven't experienced the bug, you don't need to take any action. However, If you've encountered the bug, there's one simple way to fix it and get your files back. Uninstall the update that caused the problem. I will not repeat the update KBID. 
you can you can rewind. Okay. <laughs> Since Microsoft will likely re-release the update in the future when the problem is solved, removal is the quickest and easiest fix. Now, looking at the update itself, it says it is to <clears throat> improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge. So, we suggest you stop using those browsers. Yep. Problem solved. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. Startup Mycroft AI stood up to a patent troll who filed a lawsuit against it for building an open source Linux based voice controlled assistant. Mycroft AI develops voice assistant software that runs on Linux systems, including the Raspberry Pi. The device can then respond to spoken requests, similar to Amazon Echo or Google Home, such as setting alarms and reminders, searching the web, and so on. Mycroft AI at first learned trouble was brewing when it was contacted in December by a lawyer at a Texas law firm focused on intellectual property. In an email to the startup CEO, Joshua Montgomery, the lawyer claimed Mycroft AI's technology infringed two U.S. patents belonging to their client, Voice Tech Corp. These patents described a system for a handling, quote, voice commands from a mobile device to remotely access and control a computer, end quote. Initially, the lawyer offered Mycroft AI a non-exclusive license of voice text patents. However, after Montgomery ignored the emails, voice text sued Mycroft AI for patent infringement. Earlier this month, Montgomery declared he's ready to fight the lawsuit all the way. He told the register, quote, this is a textbook case of why the U.S. patent system is fundamentally broken. Software is math running on a microchip. Sure, it's written in a particular language, and that is copyrightable, but math is not patentable, end quote. According to their abstract, the patents involve, quote, receiving audio data from mobile device at the computer. The audio data is decoded into a command. A software program that the command was provided for is determined. At least one process is executed at the computer in response to the command. Output data is generated at the computer in response to executing at least one process at the computer. The output data is transmitted to the mobile device, end quote. The Montgomery argued the patents do not reflect the complexity and architecture of modern assistants and pointed out my Mycroft AI doesn't even involve a separate mobile device. Because Mycroft AI is based in Missouri, they'd have to spend money hiring a law firm in Texas to work with its attorney. Montgomery described voice tech, in his opinion, as a, quote, patent troll, end quote, and compared such organizations to playground bullies. He said, if you don't stand up the first time, you'll get picked on forever, end quote. On February 11th, voice tech voluntarily dismissed the case. In an update posted to Mycroft blog, Montgomery says, quote, we have won the battle, not the war. He also noted the outpouring of support from the open source community, saying, over the last week, we have been humbled by the outpouring of support. Thousands of you shared the shared the post, sent in further evidence of the invalidity of the patent claims, offered your expert testimony, and even wanted to contribute financially to the legal defense. From everyone at Mycroft, thank you all. End quote. I love that the open source community comes together yes. Like that yes. and says, you know what, we're going to back you up. We're going to yeah. help you with this. I think that in all of this is the big win statement sure yeah. because it shows you that it's not just about company versus company it's the community that's behind it yeah and i mean we hear of this all the time where somebody gets kind of beaten over the head going we have this generic patent that covers yeah. just about everything you're infringing upon it yeah and it's like come on as you're as you're talking about this patent i'm thinking like have you never seen an episode of star trek <laughs> Right? Like this is this is all the stuff that we were talking about in the eighties. Like this is not right. something you can really patent. Right. This is yeah. something we've had all along. Yep. Unreal. So, I'm I mean, I, I'm really happy that they dropped it because yes. to be honest, that would have been a like 
it wouldn't have been a fair fight in that they would have had to hire a lawyer outside the state. They would have. That's so stressful for anyone, but like what a waste of resources. To know you're right, but feel like you're on the defensive and you know, the whole thing would have been yucky. And I really love that they felt supported in the way it was shown. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And ch- check out Mycroft. I mean, it's a great project. So think mm-hmm. about your uh, Amazon Echo or Google Home Mini or whatever device you have, and then create an open source kind of alternative that you can install on a Raspberry Pi mm-hmm. and create your own virtual assistant and so create cool. plugins for it and everything else. Definitely something we need to look at on yeah. Category 5. Mycroft yeah. AI, you're awesome. Way to go. <laughs> The Department of Homeland Security said on Tuesday that a U.S.-based natural gas facility had to shut down operations for two days after sustaining a ransomware infection that prevented personnel from receiving crucial real-time operational data from control and communication equipment. The advisory didn't identify the site except to say that it was a natural gas a natural gas compression facility. Such sites typically use turbines, motors, and engines to compress natural gas so that it can be safely moved through pipelines. The attack started with a malicious link in a phishing email that allowed attackers to pivot from the facility's IT network to the facility's OT network, which is the operational technology hub of servers that control and monitor physical processes of the facility. With that, both the IT and OT networks were infected with ransomware. Mm. The attack knocked out crucial control and communications gear that on-site employees depend on to monitor the physical processes. The infection didn't spread to programmable logic controllers, which actually control compression equipment, and it didn't cause the facility to lose control of operations. The advisory explicitly said that, quote, at no time did the threat actor obtain the ability to control or manipulate operations, end quote. Okay. So even though they weren't able to control operations, it's still really scary. I I have to kind of bite my tongue on that statement because it kind of feels like one of those where they're, oh, well, they didn't, they weren't actually able to take control. Well, they really were. Yeah. Maybe they they just didn't do it yet. (laughs) Maybe they didn't take control and blow something up. Sure. But they had control. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, I don't know if I like that statement. And ransomware is, uh, uh, we can be really complacent and say, it's just the encryption of my files. No, they had to get that in somehow. And how did they get that in? In this case, an email file. Right. So that email file contained ransomware, which encrypted our files. Okay. What else did it do? What else could could it have done? Mm-hmm. Could it have installed a gigabyte motherboard driver that is exploitable? <laughs> right. That has like a backdoor in it that allows them into our network and into our OT network and then into our actual controllers? Mm-hmm. You don't really know. Like that's really complacent to state unless you've got data to back it. Unless you can legitimately say... This was strictly this infection. We've found the infiltration point. We've locked it down. We've blocked every instance. But I've had computers come in for service where they said, oh, I, I accidentally fell for a phishing scam. And they installed a, they started controlling my computer. Yep. Yeah. And then we found after, is so, okay, they thought they were safe. But then we found that there was like backend software that was running as, um, as, um, services in the background. There was no uninstaller for it. It was just a service running on the computer that allowed them to remote in at any time and take control of the computer, which they're only going to do at two o'clock in the morning while you're sleeping. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what's happening. How many people would notice? Now, can you just as a precaution, I mean, I'm not saying that (laughs) this is the answer. Just turn your computer off at night. Would that be okay? In a, in a home environment. Sure, oh, but not in right? a business but environment. When it's controlling the flow of propane. <laughs> yeah. You'd probably want to leave it running. Yeah. Yeah. It's just sad that this is still becoming a regular story. Every like, single week. All the it's time. like, come on. How many times do we have to hear this before we go, yeah. hey, the world finally got it? 
And it always seems to be the big companies or the governments yeah. that are getting hit by it. It's like, now and granted, those are the ones that make the news. Mm-hmm. True. But still, it's like, you're a bigger target. And I think, Jeff, and maybe we can, you know, maybe this is a discussion to be had in the comments below, but I think that these big targets, and forgive me, if, if you're in the IT departments in these companies, forgive me, I, I don't mean this as a jab, but it's a, it's a truth. It's a sad truth that we were educated 10, 15, 20 years ago. Right. Okay. And we've been in the industry for that long. And, and some of us in the IT department, not myself, of course, but some <laughs> of us are on the verge of retirement. And that's, again, not a jab. I entirely respect what you do. However, malware has evolved. Yes. Right. Significantly. Significantly. Mm-hmm. What we're encountering now is not Natus. We're not dealing with BSVs. We're not dealing... When was the last time you ever saw a BSV? And if you know what a BSV is, then you, you're, you're this... I'm speaking to you. Yeah. It's not about those anymore. No. Now it's the evolution back in 2017 when WannaCry dropped and we started seeing ransomware infiltrating networks and we started seeing RDP attacks and, and Eternal Blue being ex- exploited and, and all of these kinds of things. That's when the cybersecurity industry woke up and said, okay, we need to re-educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't since then, and and if we're still thinking in that old mindset where viruses is, is is our threat, I'm sorry to say that viruses are not our threat. When was the last time we ever heard of a virus infiltration? It truly is. It's been a long time. Well, they'll still go, I don't want viruses. It's like, yeah, if yeah. that's your biggest concern, I have antivirus, I'm safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when was the last time you heard of a virus right. infection? <sighs> I haven't got a virus infection because I have antivirus. No, I'm just, just saying they, they that's, that's <laughs> an old school way yeah. of thinking. And it's a dangerous way of thinking because that's, that's how yeah. these big industries are getting hit yep. because we've got that old school thinking and we're not adequately educating and protecting ourselves. And it comes down, you know, it comes down to the C-suite as well educating our staff and making sure that there are cybersecurity professionals that are brought in as consultants and Mm -hmm. DLPs put in place to be able to protect our networks from today's threats. Not yes, not yesterday's, not 1999's threats. Now I know we have to get to the, uh, the next story, but is part of this a budgetary component? Surely. Like they're looking at it going, Oh, Oh, we can only put in 1% total budget for cybersecurity when really they should be looking at 10%. Like, and not that there's a defined number, but like the way that things grow, it's like you have to grow with the threats. Mm-hmm. And if that means allocating more of your budget to more cybersecurity to protect your investments and your industry, uh, whatever you're doing, you, you got to adjust the budget accordingly. You can't just stick with mm-hmm. that same number and be like, well, we've got our subscriptions. We updated that. And, oh, well, we've got an old computer we got to replace. So that's our budget. It's like, no, you got to you gotta it, think. It's beyond. exactly the same mindset though, Jeff. It's, yeah. it's that word I use, complacent. Mm-hmm. We've become complacent because uh, we're so used to the old way. Yeah. When things change, we have to change with it. Plain and simple. Otherwise, you're going to be We're just going to be reading these stories. We're, we're all under attack. Sorry. We are yeah. all under attack. Are you going to be susceptible to the attack? Right. Are you going to fall victim or are you going to be a a brick wall that they can't penetrate? Mm -hmm. We're all under attack. This is 2020. Do you remember the books when we were kids? 2020 is the future. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Here we are. (laughs) Yes, we're there. (laughs) All right. We have got to take a quick break. More of this week's top tech stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here's our next story. Amazon boss Jeff Bezos has pledged a $10 billion, pledged $10 billion to help fight climate change. He wants the money to finance work by scientists, activists, and other groups. He said, quote, I want to work alongside others to both both to amplify known ways and to explore new ways of fighting the devastating impact of climate change, end quote. Writing on his Instagram account, Mr. Bezos said the fund would begin distributing money this summer. 
Mr. Bezos has an estimated net worth of more than $130 billion. So the pledge represents almost 8% of his fortune. Some Amazon employees have urged him to do more to fight climate change. There have been walkouts and some staff have spoken publicly. Also, Mr. Bezos is financing the Blue Origin Space Program. The Seattle-based company is a neighbor of Microsoft, which in January unveiled a plan to become carbon negative by 2030. Closing his post, Mr. Bezos says, quote, Earth is the one thing we all have in common. Let's protect it together. End quote. We're going to get all kinds of comments below. There's all kinds of mixed feedback to yeah. Jeff's. Oh, really? Well, Jeff has never been known as a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think because of that, a lot of people will see this as an investment opportunity as or PR or PR or but it, saving face in yeah. light of strikes and things like that. And, and right. there's truth in that for yes. sure. But if saving face also flip side saves the world, I'm down with it. I don't know that $10 billion will save the world. However, it's a lot more than I can. Well, get. I think it's kind of like playing poker where you just like put some money in and you hope somebody else is like, I'll see you $10 billion and I'll raise you. Right. I mean, Bill Gates, Bill Gates has neighbor. some money. Yeah. Fair <laughs> you know, it's I part of me wonders if this truly is a bit of a PR thing because of the strikes that some of the employees have been doing and, and the negative media attention about it. And the fact that Amazon at the end of the day is a true global enterprise that is built on fossil fuels. And the fact that all of their product is shipping. They're shipping through planes. They're shipping can, through automobiles. You can say that, but they're based on the current infrastructure. Y yes, okay? I get and that. And they have put effort into drone-based delivery, sure. things like that. So Absolutely. we're seeing. So perhaps part of their investments might actually be to change transportation, right? We Potentially, might see, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. So, and but I mean, something like that, I think, could have more of a positive impact than saying, "I'm just going to throw money out there." However, you're thinking in terms of his business. Yes. So you're thinking Amazon can make changes and maybe they will. We'll see. Yep. It's his company. But what he's doing here is instead setting up a venture fund that says this is for environmental science, environmental yeah. research yes. and whatever, whatever can come from that. So mm -hmm. this is not. Amazon. Correct. This is an investment of 8% of his fortune that he will doing. go. Yes. That will go toward um, those, the, that research and, and things that could potentially make a, a very large impact on uh, a positive shift in, uh, in environmental impact. I also Even wonder if part of it is a, right about that. is a, a taxation matter that's okay here's the thing even if it just changes the focus for people going oh wait climate change is that important it is yeah, yeah, yeah. right just and it's, asking that question now but they're, they're but, but, but you know what i'm saying like if he if he's saying yes this is important enough to me that i'm going to put this money towards it then then that's kind that becomes the the news and then more people are focused on the climate change issue and now there'll be yeah, more perhaps. creative minds thinking about it. And $10 billion sitting in a in trust to, right. to be spent on it. Somebody's going to want to get a grant from that fund, and they might. right? And so they're going to start thinking about ways they can apply for that grant and they're going to sure. come up with yeah, great ideas. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I have to be honest, Jeff. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's a tax write-off and it's a, oh, yeah. yeah, it's going it to have a positive impact on that end of things for him. That's fine. Well, because exactly. Because if, if somebody has money and gives it to a cause and, and gets a benefit back. Awesome. Yeah. Exactly. And it's a good cause and it's making a positive impact on humanity. Then, it, then do that's it. Great. I'm not I'm saying, I'm not saying bad. I'm just saying, I think, you know, I think. To, to focus on the idea of, oh, it's about climate change. I, I think there's other things to it where it's like there's a whole plethora of positivity that comes with it. Yeah. From the positive PR, the tax write-off. Oh, sure. The impact. Let the him have it, though. Exactly. He, does, yeah. the he point deserves is, yes. it in that he's had all the opposite of that. And, and, it's, yeah. and it's funny because now that he, like, he probably feels like he can't win. 
Right? Probably. I just get, I'm getting the same flack that I got when I was ho- hoarding all my funds. Yeah. Right. And now that I've given $10 billion to a venture fund, I'm getting the same flat. Yeah, people are like, why only 8%, Jack? Yeah, why only 8% when, why not when other, 10? other the world they worth want more fi- to you. They want yeah. 50% of his no, well, of his worth. I think I mean, the, it's up to him. The truth of the it's matter entirely is entirely up to him. This money is going to grow in that more people are going to start thinking about it. More people, sure. right? So it's just the seed. Like he's just sure. planted this. Okay. Well, he didn't plant the seed. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff <laughs> Bezos saved the world. That's he right. started it all. But I mean, he he's at least listening to the important the important issues and the fact that the strikes are going on and the fact that people really do want to see people put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. You say the earth's important. Show us. Yeah. 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 So he's my my final thought is like, let's watch who qualifies for this funding. Yes. Let's watch what companies and what institutions benefit from this funding. And then we can see what kind of difference it's making. Mm Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I think ten billion dollars would go a long way in my bank account. Well, you have a <laughs> saving idea. Yep, I could do one or two things with that. Yeah, one or two. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Ring, Amazon's video doorbell system, has introduced additional steps to the way users log into their accounts and is making two-factor verification mandatory. Nice. Users will need to enter a password and unique six-digit code when they first log in to view their security footage or access the Neighbors app. Two-factor authentication was an option for Ring users before, but it was not the default setting. On Tuesday, Ring also said it would pause its data sharing with third-party firms. The change comes as Ring and Amazon face increasing scrutiny about privacy protection and data sharing. In a blog post, Ring's president, Alila Rohi, said the company takes, quote, digital security and privacy seriously, end quote, and would look at additional ways to improve security. Ring's new login system will be similar to other two-factor authentication processes. After signing in with the username and password, the app will ask to send a text message or email with a one-time six-digit code. Once the code is entered, the user will have access to the app and be able to view footage from outdoor and indoor cameras. Owners will then be able to use their mobile apps for 30 days before they're required to go through the two-step process again, unless they log out of their account in the meantime. Last week, Nest, Google's home security device, began requiring two-factor authentication as well. Good move. I like yeah. this. I like that they're making it a compulsory thing. Not a fan of the 30-day window, though. Why? How come? Uh, I think it should be shorter, to be honest. But if you log out, but because I'm thinking, like, because this is my computer, yeah. right? So it's only going to remember it on my computer. Right. If I switch to a different computer or somebody tries to compromise my account, they're going to need the 2FA in order to sign in. Mm-hmm. Right. But still, I feel like 30 days is a long time. But you can log out. Let's say you don't log out. Like how much can be accessed in those 30 days on potentially a shared device? I mean, I would hope that you're not using it on a shared device, but I think for yeah. a lot of people you know, well, on a home computer or maybe like a, a laptop or something, I, I, I'm assuming this is also going to be the same case with phones. If you're viewing on your phone, like right. I think that that likely 30 days is the mandatory. You can probably set it to be more frequent. I would hope want. so. I mean, I have a lot of, two-factor authentication devices and most of them I just set to every time. I think also though you're you're putting a local spin on the security. Right. You're thinking along the terms of somebody breaking into your house and having access to your security cameras, but if they have that, then you, they're already in. <laughs> yeah, no, no, fair enough. I, I get that. But I I don't know. I just to me 30 days seems long. I could two weeks, I'd be okay with two weeks. Two weeks makes sense. But 30 days to me seems long. What do you think? Should it be 45 days? Well, don't go there. I think that the idea here is not so much the spin that you're giving it, but instead it's to prevent illicit access from outside. I don't, I don't want somebody from Latvia 
being able to access my security camera. No, of course not. I don't want... Nothing against Latvia, by the way. Nothing against Latvia. <laughs> They're very peaceful people. I don't want somebody... <laughs> and you can have access to my cameras. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give you my 2FA code right now. It's six digits. Um, but my my point is that I think that's what I'm trying to lock yes. out. I'm trying to lock down yeah. people that are trying to hack into my security cameras. I want that two-factor authentication to block that attempt. Because yep. even if they get in, they can't get further than the 2FA because they don't have my device to get that code. Right. right. But it, it's not just text. It was also email. So yes. if they've gotten into your... But once it's a one-time use password. So once I've logged in on my computer with that 2FA code, yep. they can't use that same code again Understood. to access it on their computer. But if they have computer. access to your, e I mean, like, this is why I'm saying 30 days is not great. I would rather see You it. know what is great, though? That it's happening at all. Yes, exactly. And that it's is compulsory. I like that it's, mandatory. it's compulsory yes. by default, which is, that's the advantage here. Because right. Because we don't all think about, especially novice users who go to a super center and buy one of these smart cameras right. and don't know that, hey, I really need to enable 2FA. Mm -hmm. You know what? Some people are right turned off by 2FA, which blows my mind. When it I sounds have, technical, Sasha. Right. When I have people over to my house and I'm, you know, showing them my VR and I have my Steam account, it's 2FA, mm -hmm. and they're like, why do you have it so that it texts your phone? <laughs> and then, just next time you go to a friend, just like, be like, hey, what's the 2FA for your Wi-Fi? I yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I have to like explain it to them. But they're like, yeah. oh, well, like, it, like my banking is two-factor authentication. Like all, like I like it. it. To me, it feels good. Well done. Yeah. I, Thanks. I yeah. think 2FA <laughs> should be the default for all security. For everything. Yeah. 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 It, so. it just makes sense. And it, and it, let's be clear, and Jeff, it is not perfect security. No, no. it's okay? not perfect. It's not perfect. It's not flawless. It's not uncompromisable. It's just a very good added layer of protection to prevent the, the average to fairly exceptional hacker from being able to access your stuff. Yep. That's all. So it's a really good, easy way to do that. And, and you know, it's until they come up with something better... That's the best thing going. So uh, comment below. What do you think? And how many days should 2FA on your ring doorbell be set for, for by default? For Jeff. Let Jeff know. Yeah, let Jeff know. <laughs> Big thanks to Ray W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show as much as we have. It's been a blast being here, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. See ya. Bye. Oh, you're a sharp one. Thank you.